Okay, David, uh, we're into the uh, hortatory or paranetic yeah, section of, right. of Hebrews, and we heard uh, last time a lot about um, uh, faith and its complexity uh, in chapter 11 and about the continuity of um, people of faith from yeah. Old Testament uh, and on. Um, and we have that summarized at the beginning of, of uh, the material we're now looking at, chapter 12. Uh, how does that summary work? Well, it seems to me it, it, it works in many ways, but the two that strike me as most important is that the people who have just gone before us now become not only examples of faithfulness for us to follow, but in some sense they are the community of saints that cheers us on. Um, he doesn't go into, the author doesn't go into great explication about all that, but there's this, they, they are not off the scene entirely. They're waiting to get into the promised land with us and they're cheering us on on the way. So we look back at them and then we look to Jesus and strikingly we look to Jesus mostly by looking ahead. Uh, he's the one who's leading us in. Maybe this is the Joshua thing again, but certainly he's the first one to get us into, into the promised land, into the Sabbath rest. He's the exemplar of faith. He's the embodiment of faith, and he's the perfecter of our faith, so we don't have to do that by ourselves. I think it's a great text. Mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. text that sums up so much, and I think provides deep comfort uh, in the 21st century as well as in the first. Mm -hmm. Certainly the notion of a great cloud of witnesses is something that you hear no, a lot of. And, yeah. uh, important to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, in, in my tradition, we talk about the, uh, the community of saints. Yeah, and, and we do um, too, just know. quietly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, then we have uh, some specific warnings and yeah. uh, exhortations yeah. here in, in uh, chapter 13 uh, that maybe say something about the situation of the, the audience. Uh, in vision. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a, uh, a kind of metaphor that we have in other places, which is that when discipline comes, when, you have when tough times come, God, like a good parent, is disciplining us, so if we show perseverance, we will grow into maturity because that's the way that a good parent acts, and God is a good parent in this case. What we don't have is very much specificity about what the trials are that they're being asked to endure. And again, the question which I think you've helped me suggest is probably not answerable. Does it, unlike 1 Corinthians, for example, we have no clear evidence that somebody's written about the seven trials they're going through. Uh, we have some sense that he knows what the Christian life is like, and maybe that he knows that they live under threat as we all do, but not so much that he's got a particular uh, problem in mind. But discipline is a way in uh, suffering, pain, trouble, is a way in which God helps to discipline us, and I think that's part of what he's calling them to do. And then in, in, at, at the very middle of chapter 12, um, he's been talking at the beginning of chapter 12 about kind of running a race. And here we have other language, which is, uh, if not exactly athletic, at least kind of physical, to lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, make straight paths. There's a sense um, throughout this letter that we've got a pioneer and a perfecter, that we're running a race, that we're wandering through a wilderness, that we're on our way to somewhere, and that we need to be strengthened on the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the fact that we do have uh, some weak knees from time to time And the is, fact we uh, do is, is, is acknowledged, acknowledged, I think, mm -hmm. and not simply... Uh, and we're, we're not simply uh, criticized for that. That's, that's, mm -hmm. And we have a high priest who can sympathize. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And then we have um, a, a little bit uh, more of a warning in chapter 12, verse 14, um, kind of framed uh, positively, pursue peace with everyone and yeah. holiness, but uh, don't fail to obtain uh, God's grace. Yeah, right? and don't be like Esau who sold his birthright. And right. then we have to ask, okay, what's the birthright they're in danger of selling? And is this, again, apostasy or is this more general? It, it, it becomes a great example of your kind of limiting case. I said sometimes Judas is a limiting case. Look what happened to him. Esau, in a way, becomes a limiting case here. We've had all the heroes of the faith in chapter 11. Now we have the anti-hero. And being cheered by them, we're warned by him. Right, so um, a kind of standard issue uh, negative uh, I think example. So. Yeah, I think uh, so. That then leads to this uh, marvelous image of uh, a contrast between uh, Sinai and yeah, the land. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's going on with that? Well, um, poetically, this is extraordinarily powerful. I'm not, my sense is that this is woven through uh, beautifully with imagery, but in the, in the very first verses and in here, uh, I, insofar as I can make a kind of aesthetic judgment on somebody's Greek, it seems to me that this is a place where the, where the power of imagery and the beauty of the rhetoric uh, becomes kind of overwhelming, as it does in our, in our English translations. But it's, it's our contrast, again, between old and new, and now the old is Sinai and the new is Jerusalem. Um, the old is Moses and the new is Jesus. Uh, the Jerusalem which has come, as, for example, in the book of Revelation, is now a heavenly Jerusalem. This is not 
a prediction of the reestablishment of the temple or any kind of immediate earthly uh, reality. But it's, it's clear that for, for reasons um, both Christian and exegetical, uh, our writer wants to say that the new Zion, which is in heaven, is the place where God dwells. And unlike Sinai, where God is fundamentally fearful, here God is ge fundamentally generous um, and exalted. Uh, the, the great, I heard a great sermon by a colleague of mine, Justo Gonzalez, this last week where he talks about the end time being coming to God's great fiesta. He's Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's the feast, the festival becomes the fiesta. And I think that wouldn't work for me, but for him that was terrific. So here's the Jerusalem fiesta. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Th thinking about uh, the book of Revelation, um, uh, I think when we were talking about that, we, we came to the conclusion that the, the new heavenly Jerusalem is somehow present here on earth absolutely. in, the, in the, the form of the church. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and there's, there's talk here about the way in which we offer regular sacrifices to God. And I take it this means both the way in which we worship, though there are no clear rubrics for worship here, and the way in which we treat each other, that, that we are to live as, as a community of faith, but we're also to perform the faithful sacrifices of worship and anxiety that I do think this is a little too cheap, but on the whole, some people aren't showing up mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. for the Lord's day, and he thinks they should. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned reference uh, to worship. I think you're, you're thinking about uh, what happened in chapter uh, 13. Yeah where uh, in verse 15 it talks about um, uh, let us continually offer a sacrifice yeah, of praise exactly. to God. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one of the things we haven't talked about is, is whether there are any uh, sort of specific uh, correlates in, in our worship experience to what goes on in Hebrews. I know there's been a lot of debate in, since the Reformation yeah. about um, Hebrews and uh, Christian worship and yeah. priesthood and all of that. Yeah, how how yeah. do you read that? Um, I read it as being useful imagery, but not much specific guidance. That that it's not coincidental that we can read Catholic worship into this, and we can read Protestant worship into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think you can't leave out is the importance of penitence and perseverance, and that worship should, in, should include and encourage us in both those things. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, I think uh, there's a sense of that there should be some kind of church order. Uh, we'd have no specific sense of who the leaders are, but there clearly are leaders. Yeah, this is not seven, just yeah. bapto anarchy mm -hmm. uh, in verse seven. Um, and they're, they're, they're not um, Catholic bishops. They're not. They're not Catholic bishops, mm -hmm. but they're not just. Uh, here's my opinion. There's your opinion. Let's all cheer God. There's mm -hmm. some sense in which the, there is a, a group of leadership set up. There's a concern for marriage without us being quite clear what the, what the particular dangers are. And there is the ever popular and ever necessary, keep your lives free from the love of money mm -hmm. and be mm -hmm. content with what you have, mm -hmm. uh, which in we, we, my we, church is darn good. We, we finally found love. And we finally found love at the beginning of 13. So we had faith we in had chapter faith 11. We had faith usually in 11. We, we have hope, hope embodied there. Hope in, all the way through, through really. Mount Zion. Yeah, certainly in the Mount Zion thing. And then at the beginning of 13, we have the, uh, the reminder that let mutual love continue. And love here, as for Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, is primarily love in the community. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's the way in which we treat one another. Remember, we've, we remember that we are Jesus' brothers and sisters, that we're steadfast as he is, and that as he shows love, we show love to one another. L lots of specific concrete actions are uh, yeah. referenced here in terms yeah, of love. They are. I remember those who are in prison. In prison. Torture, uh, don't, those yeah. Tortured. Tor be, be, so, have a good marriage. Right. Look away. Look out for fornicators and adulterers, and don't love money. Mm -hmm. uh, what about here? I'm no. I know I'm supposed to be uh, the recipient of your wise questions, but here's one that always puzzles me. What's this outside the camp business? I, mean, I know what it is in the story of Jesus that that the crucifixion takes place outside the gates of the city. What are we? who hear this letter being exhorted to do. It, it, we've sort of seen already what we're supposed to do in-house. Mm -hmm. In-house, we're supposed to have good worship, love one another, treat each other with respect, not love money. What are we doing outside the camp? Yeah, uh, th this is an extension, I think, of, of um, one of the motifs that's run through the whole of the, uh, the letter. Uh, that we're called to move beyond where we currently are. Okay. Uh, like the people of the Exodus generation back there in uh, chapters 3 and 4, yeah. uh, like uh, Abraham uh, in chapter yep. 11, yeah. uh, uh, called to um, yeah. serve God someplace outside of the comfort zone yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that he was familiar with. Uh, and uh, I think it's Im implicit, too, in the image of, of Christ, the uh, the uh, pioneer and yeah. perfecter of faith all, in chapter ahead. 12, always yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, that, that little uh, passage ends uh, with a reference to the cross, which is not a major part of the symbolism of, 
of Hebrews, as it is, let's say, in Paul. Right, right, right. Uh, and here it's, it's clearly uh, that the cross is, is something negative. Yeah. Uh, he uh, yes. endured it, disregarding yeah, yeah. its shame. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so yeah. then took his uh, seat of the right and hand. And then back. goes where he's supposed so, to be. So yeah. uh, I think moving outside of the camp um, is uh, a call to continue in that um, that direction, to be part of the, the wandering people of God, yeah. uh, not to be uh, content with, um, uh, with the comfort zone of yeah. uh, an earthly Jerusalem. There may be, if this is directed toward a, uh, a Jewish um, uh, audience, or at least partially mm -hmm. Jewish audience, there may be some uh, some specific uh, recommendation here too about not uh, not continuing in uh, in a Judaizing mode. Yeah, yeah, possibly. And that that seems to be yeah. uh, implicit in the reference to uh, what seemed to be kashrut laws. Yeah, some of the food um, stipulations back yeah. there in yeah. uh, chapter uh, 13, verse nine, yeah. and following. Uh, regulations concerning food, etc. Um, so the, there may be something of that sort uh, involved, some specific reference to um, uh, moving beyond uh, traditional um, uh, Jewish practices. Okay. But I think it has a broader uh, reference to being part of the movement out. Well, homiletically, yeah. it's a it's a it's a beaut because every church I know is a camp, mm. and then the question is how permeable are the walls, and how easy is it to let people in? But sometimes more important, how easy it is easy for us to get out and serve the Lord who is actually often outside the tent, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. I think is a powerful word. Um, so we also have a, a place here in, in, verses, in verse six where for the first time now, I think it's not God or Jesus speaking the Psalm, but in a kind of a liturgical antiphonal word, we the congregation get to say, in the basis of everything we've heard, on mm -hmm. the basis of all this confidence we have in our pioneer and perfecter, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Which mm -hmm. is a fabulous affirmation of, of a people now willing to live by that faith, mm -hmm. which we have seen uh, spread out, portrayed, illumined in chapter 11, but above all spread out, portrayed, and illumined in Jesus Christ, our pioneer and perfecter. Right, it really is interesting that what you point to about the, uh, the use of this psalm and the other psalms that we've heard yeah. earlier on often have Jesus voicing yeah. them uh, in our author's uh, yeah. reading of the, uh, the text. Um, and it makes a lot of sense then if we are following in Jesus' footsteps that we should be praying Absolutely. the Psalms we now, get, as we he get did. to pray too, yeah. And I, I think that ties in with the, uh, the reference to whatever's going on in, in um, uh, worship uh, in verses 15 and, uh, and 16, where we have sacrifice used in two metaphorical ways, the sacrifice of praise, which is precisely yep. this kind of thing, yep. offering Psalms, yep. uh, uh, hymns and spiritual songs, and then um, uh, the uh, the good works. They're doing good. Yeah, yeah. doing good doing in good. verse yeah. 16, which is uh, also described as sacrifices that are pleasing yeah. to, uh, to God. So that's where uh, true worship is no. for, for this fellow yeah. uh, or gal. There was yeah. one, one yeah. theory that this was written by uh, Priscilla. Uh, I'd Paul's, realize that. Yeah. Uh, uh, erstwhile uh, fellow worker. Uh, so uh, whoever wrote this, I think, has that in mind as uh, what true worship is all about. And, and just before we get to the, to the closing words, which in some ways we talked about in our first session about how does Timothy get into this and where is it written, and these are the, among the clues we get, you get that really marvelous and I think moving benediction, which mm -hmm. prays that and working perfectly with everything we said, we prays that Christ will make us complete in everything, mm -hmm. perfect at last. Right, in, um, in 1320 and following, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, and the conclusion is, um, uh, it, what does it tell us? It tells us that there were people from Italy yeah. who sent greetings right. to someone. Were they still in Italy yeah. or are they left Italy and gone somewhere else, right? Yeah, I, I tend... You think they're still in Italy? Uh, no, I tend to think that they are people uh, who are from Italy, Out. uh, you know, in Alexandria yeah. or Ephesus or something, yeah, yeah. and they're sending um, uh, greetings back, back home. To the, back to the so game. So I, yeah, I think that's probably yeah. where this text was going. Yeah. And though it's not his main word, he ends with a great word, grace be with you all. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I, I say this, Having worked this through with you in the last few days and, and the last few weeks, uh, my sense of the grace that's presented in this gospel, in this epistle, this homily, is richer and deeper than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. I think it's a marvelous text. There yes. we go.